You are going to meet an artist today that's going to blow your socks off. Uh, Lori Putnam, welcome to day number 178 and happy Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and I appreciate you taking a Saturday. I know that you, you, have, you have so many places you have to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, in my front yard, in my backyard, in my, you know, front yard again. <laughs> so what has quarantine uh, life been like for you? You know, we're really lucky because we we live on five acres in the country. So it, social distancing is not really a big problem for us. And my husband is able to work from home. He works in the loft at the studio every day. And... So we're really, really very fortunate that our staying home, I had actually planned to stay home this year and paint in the studio anyway. Unfortunately, I'm more busy just because of all of the online teaching and things like that, but it, but I'm still, I'm enjoying being home. It's gonna be hard going back to being a travel all the time person, whenever that yeah. is. Well, I, I've kind of decided I'm not gonna do that. I, because I, as you know, I was out 30, 40 weeks a year and I just, after being home all this time, I just don't want to do it anymore. It's mm -hmm. like, I, I realized that I was, I was running from something, you know, I was like, just trying to stay in busy and going places and, and realized, you know, I just love being home, of course, being able to reconnect with the kids and because they were forced home, they're in college now. But anyway, um, so what are you going to talk about today? We'd love to see what you're going to do. Well, one of the things I seem to experience most when I'm teaching are people who want to get, you know, like the eyelashes on the frog on the table before they think about the big picture. And so I want to talk about ways to make a painting solid from the beginning. So if you decide you want to put eyelashes on that frog, that's up to you at the end. But if you start with that, you know, it, the whole thing's going to fall apart. So mostly okay. design. Okay, good. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And would you be willing, if you're able, I don't know if you are, would you be willing to kind of give us a view of your studio and maybe some sure. paintings? Sure, sure. Let me see if... Uh, you don't I have don't to do I... it now. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll drop off. Uh, I'll, okay. I mean, I'll drop you off. I'm going to make a couple of announcements and then okay. uh, we, we can do that. You can figure out how we're going to do it, when we're going to do it. It's up to you. <laughs> if I can turn, I don't know if I can turn the camera around, but we'll figure yeah. it out. I don't know. Well, you'll have a minute to figure that out. And so okay. we'll, we'll <laughs> All see right. you in a minute. Our guest today is Lori Putnam. This is a, a painting to give you a feel for some of her style. This is a painting she did in this video called Bold Brushstrokes and Confident Color. And what I'd like to do is bring her on now. Lori, welcome back. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. It's really good to be here. It's just good to see you. <laughs> That's good. I was thinking the same thing. You know, we we talk once in a while, but we haven't really done a video thing. And, and uh, you know, you were talking about how you're busier now than you were before, even though you're not traveling. Um, and, and that's because you're doing a lot of online teaching. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, so I ended up, because there was so much going on online that was sort of covering up my art website, that I created a completely different website for all of my online teaching. So it's easy to remember, it's lauriputnam.online. <laughs> how, how, how cute. But anyway, and so <laughs> if you go there, you'll see all that's going on. But I started just very simply, I was already doing a little bit of it anyway, well before this started. And then once things, you know, I saw this need, really, I started doing things for people that were you know, pretty budget friendly. You know, I wanted to sort of, I have to, obviously I have to pay for all of, you know, what it's like. You've got all these programs you have to pay for every month to be able to do this. But I wanted to be able to do it as inexpensively as possible so that, you know, people, it was like giving back, you know, something. And obviously there are some things I do that are also to make money. But at any rate, I ended up doing, a lot of live workshops. As a matter of fact, I'm done with that right now. Yay. <laughs> because I really need to paint. 
Um, but you know, a lot of live workshops and a lot of, uh, like I have a private atelier online that, you know, just, just for watching today, you can join that. You just got to tell me where you heard that that's, that's what you got to do. Uh, that's on Facebook. But anyway, so if you, you know, what all of these things I've been doing have been everything from just little three minutes. You don't really have a lot of time to, you know, two hour lessons. And it's, it's amazing how much equipment you have to get and how much time it takes to do something that seems really pretty simple, hopefully, to the people watching it. But I've really enjoyed it. Well, you're fortunate to have a techie husband that helps out, too. I would imagine that. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, it was you. Oh, excuse me. I guess that was very sexist of me. I apologize. I know that Mark has been very involved in your tech in the past. So you had to do all this on your own. Yeah, he's got his yeah. own job. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. He's that's right. Well, I'm proud of you. Uh, yes, it's. Uh, I mean, we have uh, at, at our our production studios now. We have a sound stage. We've probably got over a million dollars worth of equipment. It just, yeah. it, you know, and that's how. And, and there's nothing wrong with charging for something. I mean, you have to get your expensive yeah. money back and your time back. And and of course, what people don't understand is that artists uh, oftentimes are not selling as much artwork in this time. Now, some are, and you probably are, but, but at the same time, you know, we, you know, artists oftentimes make their money from live workshops. I can't go out and do them. You know, we all have to make a living. So, uh, well, yeah. I'm proud of you. Good job. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what, uh, well, first off, where did, where did you and I meet? I was trying to think about this. Was at, was it at the first plein air convention? No, it was in the Adirondacks. Uh, I mean, that's the first time we officially met was I came to the Adirondacks one June. So that had to be pretty early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It was. And you had not, um, you were talking about, you were putting together this thing that you were going to have like a plein air convention sort of thing. And, and so you hadn't had the first one yet. Okay. So, well, that was, uh, the convention is now nine years ago, technically 10 by the time we have it, even though it'll be the ninth annual. So, so you must've been in the, you know, like the first Adirondack event, uh, because it, it's, it would have been 10 years this year. Yeah. Must've been, must've yeah. been, it was, uh, and you know, I, uh, came and just, you know, was a little bit nervous, I guess, because I didn't really know what it was going to be. Um, and it was just so much fun. And we, you and I passed a few times, you know, uh, and spoke, but we really didn't meet until, you know, like officially until like the very end. You're just, you know, you're everywhere. And I was just ready to paint. I was just, I just wanted to paint. And at the very end, we had like maybe a 15 minute conversation in the kitchen of the guest house, I guess the right. cabin. Um, right. and that was really the longest conversation we had there. You, yeah. you know, because at dinner we might all be at the same table, but there's everybody talking. And right. so that, that's our first real official, official conversation where we got to I'm know each other. I'm not remembering that. I, I can very clearly remember, uh, when you stood up, when I was on stage at the plein air convention in Monterey, I think it was Monterey. Would that be correct? Uh, uh, yeah, I was in Monterey several years. I was even at the first one. Uh, oh, you were in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. well, maybe, maybe maybe that's that's the time I remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's we've known each other a long time now, and uh, have developed a great friendship and have spent a lot of time together since then. And so, anyway, thanks for doing this today. What are you going to show us? So. A lot of times what I see in my classes or um, when somebody will send me work to critique, they put together in their minds what they want to paint, but it doesn't come across on the canvas because they didn't plan ahead. And uh, so immediately they're moving to the tiniest shapes possible and by shapes it could be a literal shape of like 
you know, a leaf, or it could just be a dash, whatever, but it's a shape, it's a mark. And they start wanting something to look like something so quickly that they miss a lot of the foundational things. And so I generally have them make a thumbnail sketch, which, you know, works pretty well the first couple of days of the workshop. And then by the third day, they think they've got it and they stop doing that. And that's not good. Um, because then it all falls apart again. And so if you can have a really good foundation that you're painting from, it, particularly in plein air, but I do it in the studio as well. If you have a really good solid design, then you can take all the time you want to put in your little marks and however you want to make your little marks and however detailed or uh, full of information you want your personal style painting to be. But people seem to be, I guess there's some ego that gets in the way or something. They don't want to look stupid by having these big squares that look like, you know, pieces of construction paper of a first grader or something. But it's so important. Otherwise, you, especially in plein air, you tend to get you know, sort of romanced by the new thing that's happening and you start chasing the light and you start putting in all these little things and you just really want to finish that one part. And then it just, it, what I find is the values, and I know they're all levels listening in. So the values that is how light or dark things are, the big value shapes fall apart. They just crumble. And it's like, uh, it's like having brick old block under your house that was never cured you know it just starts to fall apart and everything goes away and you don't have a strong foundation anymore and so if you can just discipline yourself to take the 10 to 15 minutes that it takes to figure out the foundational part and that is your thumbnail sketch then you can enjoy the painting part and not be so fearful of losing it you know inevitably laurie uh, uh, i oftentimes will have a painting and i i can't figure out what's wrong with it and i usually usually will reach out to a friend you know somebody like you and i'll say i can't see it what's wrong with it and every single time every single time they come back with the same answer and that is you've lost your big shapes you know, if, go back and get your big shapes in and it will read properly. Well, yeah, you know, I, I still get brush happy and um, because it's the fun part, right? And so, I said a million times, a lot of times the end of the painting for me is taking something back out because I just got a little too brush happy and lost that foundation. And I, I see it. I see it so often. And. I think part of it is just the, like I said, the ego of it. Maybe what if somebody sees this looking so silly? Part of it is fear uh, that if you don't get something that looks like something, then it, it's not going to work. But the opposite is true. You, know, you have to think, you have to think foundation. And then, you know, you start to, to put in the framing which is the medium shapes. And then finally, when you finally get all the big pieces and the framing and all that done, then you can put on the door handles, but you don't put on the door handles first. Yeah, okay, but I wanna, I wanna talk about a couple of things that you brought up, because I think they're really important. You have, uh, you, you talked about the performance aspect, right? We're worried about what other people think. This is especially true in a plein air environment. If we're painting next to other artists, if we're in a group setting, or if there are consumers who are wandering around behind mm -hmm. us, we're worrying more about what they think than what we're doing. How do you overcome that? Yeah. You know, I'm not sure that I have a really good answer for that because I still fall victim to it sometimes, you know. Um, and, I, and when I do that, it, it, I'm always beating myself up at the end that I did something sort of out of sequence because I was manipulated to feel I needed to do that. Um, and it's so important not to, but, but you, every time you go that route, it is so disappointing. And it's easy to say, just don't, 
just don't care what anybody thinks. That's easy to say until, especially if it's like a quick draw or something. Like you say, there are people milling about and looking at what you're doing and thinking, wow, you know, how did this person get in this event? But um, (laughs) it's, it's, it's in the end, if you can just, just remember that you've pulled it off before you've gotten to the finish line before and it worked and, and believe in yourself. Uh, I have found a a trick that works for me. Um, First off, I do care what other people think. It's unfortunate, but I do. And I have found the worst thing for me is if I look at what the other artists are doing, Mm -hmm. right? So I, I like to take a break, walk away from my canvas. And the one thing I used to do is I kind of wander around and look at what all the other artists were doing. And I, and, and, and uh, every single time it's like, Oh, I like the way she did that tree Mm -hmm. or that Mm -hmm. light on that tree. Or I like the way he did those bricks. And then I come back and I start messing with my painting and trying to put those Mm -hmm. things in. And I completely mess up the concept because I'm taking their ideas, putting them into my painting and it's not my painting anymore. So I have found that it, I, I just tell myself, I'm not looking at anybody else's work, uh, until, or, or once in a while, I'll glance at somebody else's work, but I have to say to myself, look, I am not changing direction now. Mm-hmm. And having that original drawing, that original note and really makes a big difference. Cause then you're, you're like, this is my foundation. This is my roadmap. You want to talk about note hands? Yeah. And that's really where I was going to go next. Uh, ah. A lot of times people uh, will try to force, um, we'll try to force a scene into the no tan. The no tan, which is just a shape of light and a shape of dark and how they design together um, to make the the sketch, the thumbnail sketch, not the, it's not the little pieces, it's the big pieces. The way they go together really only works in a situation that you have like strong light and shadow, uh, front light, something that can be divided into a light and a dark pattern. And so whether that's uh, uh, just light and dark or whether it's light and shadow, which could be two totally different things. We don't have time to get into all that today. That's when you'd use a notan. And so you would try very hard then to, to choose a design that is very strongly uh, clear. This is my dark piece and this is my light piece and get that in and it also helps you because especially in plein air because the sun keeps moving right so if you get that design in your head and on paper you don't tend to chase it you know when the light starts to move and so the no tan is two big shapes i see the confusion i see sometimes is when people talk about no tans to mean something with three values and that's no longer uh, that's no longer a true two-piece statement anymore it's a three-piece statement and I'm going to talk about that a little bit further down because I don't want to confuse you just yet but um, so I have a couple of examples can I go ahead and go to those and talk about that just a minute absolutely you've got about 25 minutes okay great so I have a couple of examples here of uh, paintings that I've just recently done that are good uh, sources for a no tan design. And now I have some thumbnail sketches up here. Normally my thumbnails are not that big. Normally they're very, very small. And um, I put together these little uh, sketchbooks for my students because inevitably they would do a thumbnail sketch that was square for a rectangular canvas or something. And so they have uh, different measurements on them and places for the students to take notes. And I had these little, I had these sketchbooks made for them. And so that's generally the size of my uh, thumbnail sketch. And I like to use these markers that have uh, a different value on each end. If you can see that there's a a little bit different value on one end than the the other. What is the brand on the marker? Because everybody's going to ask. It's uh, it's one of those Zig markers. It's the company, and it's called Brushables. Okay. And so it's um, somebody put that know, in the comments, please. 
So I can, I can easily even, we're, we may not get to key today, but I can easily even decide, you know, if it's a lighter value key painting or a darker or somewhere in between with just two markers. Um, so that's generally how I would make my thumbnail sketches. But in order for you to be able to see this today, I'm, I redid my sketches for you here much larger. And so we're going to talk about this, this piece first. You can see the light's a little glary there. But this is a scene from Staves, England, coast of Yorkshire. And I'll be going back there to teach again next year. I love teaching there. It's so gorgeous. It's a beautiful paintable place. And okay, I'm uh, going with you. Yeah, it is it is. I mean it's a painter's paradise and and all the great painters have painted there. So it's really I'm really glad Simi at Rosemary Brushes asked me to go back again. But anyway, and we only have like three spots left, so hurry up. But anywho, um and so this uh if I can get this where it's not too much glare this entire piece all of this is represented with one big shape here in this no tan now i drew a little light line there i don't know if you can appreciate it but i drew that just so i remembered where the top of this land mass back here sort of comes in because I, in, in my design, I wanted to make sure I didn't have the same amount of space here as I had here and some stuff like that. But basically, what you need to have on your foundational sketch is not any detail. The detail's in front of you. It's it's not going anywhere, that unless it's a person, and then it might. But this is, how, this is what you need. Now, if I take the 10 minutes it takes to you know, nail that, then I can enjoy this. And you know, at this time of day, that light moves really quickly. So if I like that shape, when I see it, I need to go ahead and do the sketch and pay attention to that sketch. Now, also, you'll see in my uh, thumbnail sketches that I do, you'll see that I make some uh, notes down at the bottom of that little booklet. And I've made those here as well. And this is something that you would make uh, either from a photograph or from observation from life, you'd go ahead and make yourself a few notes because unless you had painted, you know, 6,000 plein air pieces, your visual memory is not going to hold that. You think it will, but it won't. Inevita inevitably, you will forget something. And so what I have written here in my side of my notes is that the light that's everything in this shape, right? Are a value between 20 and 30%. If you use the Munsell scale, that's a seven or eight, but I generally don't, but I just wanted to say that in case somebody's thinking about that. But it's, you know, to me, the lightest piece here is only 20 to 30% darker than pure white. And I've written here that the value of the, the shadows is between 40 and 70. There are 40 and 70 different little things in here. The important thing to note is that the 30, the darkest light, and the 40, the lightest shadow, are a full step apart. And as long as I keep that relationship, and don't put anything up in here that is supposed to be here and anything up in here that's supposed to be here i'm good i'm really golden okay but i'm so, gonna i'm gonna ask you a question about that okay so i'm looking at this piece and and so i'm looking at your dark shape and i'm saying okay mm -hmm. there's not a there's not a pure dark in according to your notes there's not a pure dark in it but what about things like you have like the edge of the dock or the windows? They, they look like they're a pure dark. Is that an exception to that rule? So it's like darks actually, on top of darks? Actually, there are a few little tiny um, dark accents in here. And right. the tiny dark accents, uh, you know, might be like this edge right here. And, I, and this yeah. edge is what gives you some distance between here and here because all of this is so similar. 
Yeah. But the um, the majority of this, and this is my next note. It's like you're. It's like you know what I'm going to say. In my next note said, <laughs> <laughs> says that the majority of the value is 50% or darker. And so most, of, even though it looks really dark in here, most of this is really hovering around 50% right in the middle. And it would really change it. I was thinking about that. It, looking at this now, it would really change it if it was too dark. Yes. Yeah, oh, yes. And a lot of people do that. Um you know, that's just the way their, their thought process is. But I can remember uh, a real aha moment for me was once I was painting with Scott Christensen out in Carmel. And I had, you know, a distant rock, you know, further away than this. And I had a shadow really, really dark. I mean, I didn't think it was that dark, but, you know, I probably had it this dark. And he said, I want you to get down and look at this bush right in front of you. And I want you to look at how dark that deepest dark of that little piece of shadow is, that those little tiny dark accents, and compare that to this. And it was like, you know, a million steps apart. And so I think sometimes because we're staring at this next to so much light, our tendency is to make that too dark. But it's 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 really not. I mean, this is a lot of sense. This is one step above mid value back there. Well, I, I was looking at shadows this morning, um, a really beautiful sunny day here in the Adirondacks. And I was looking at shadows and I noticed there was a shadow projected uh, from one house onto the other house. And the other house was in full light. And my brain was tricked because I told myself, well, a shadow is dark, but that shadow was very transparent, had a lot of light in it. And it, it mm -hmm. was, it was not a huge step from the light. It, it would, it would, you know, if the light was a 20, this was a 35 or something, you know, it yes. wasn't so right. super deep, but I think we train our brains to think shadows are dark, but not all shadows are dark. No, Remember that even... show when we were kids, maybe you're too young, but there was a show called <laughs> dark shadows. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not that young. <laughs> I, think I, wouldn't, I, I, think... I wouldn't admit that. I think we're probably, I don't know, maybe we're the same age. I don't know. I may be older than you. I've certainly got. I, I never, I never tell. <laughs> grayer hair than you. Um, and by the way, I really like the gray. The salt pepper is a good thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I went through a phase. <laughs> I went through a phase where I was really freaked out and I, and I started dyeing my hair and I looked like one of those old people that dyes their hair. And I thought, oh, I hate it. Yeah. Good for yeah. you. Good for you. Okay, back to the lesson. All so right. in this one, what makes this distance, what makes set set back so far is this hard edge right here that is the only real 70% in the whole piece. And so, you know, not only do I need this foundation here, I need these notes, and then I need to know what I'm going to do to push that back so that it doesn't just all look exactly the same. And ironically, this was painted on a, a board that was, had already had something painted on it, you know, just reusing old materials. And a lot of this is what was left from wiping off the painting before, and it was just the right value. So that, do, was, do you, that was luck. Do you find that you push values or you push things back further than what you see them so that you create the sense of distance? some artists will do that. It's like, even though it's a little closer, you want it to, it doesn't read as far enough away. So you lighten it and push it back a little bit more. Or do you always try to paint what you see? You know, I try to, well, it depends on if I'm creating or if I am documenting. For instance, most of the time in plein air, I'm learning and documenting. In the studio, I might try something just to be more creative. I might, uh, you know, uh, take a lot of things that are up here and use them to say something else that I want to say that isn't in any photo I've ever seen necessarily. It's just experience. And so I think it just depends on the situation. Um, I won't say I never do it, but generally speaking, like I really wanted this. There is a lie in this 
but I'm not going to tell you what it is. But I really wanted this to feel like the character of the place. And why, why um, would you say it's a lie? In, in, in other oh, words, you're saying because there's something that you put in that wasn't there, or something right, you took out. Well, right. Yeah. You really. You know, yeah, you're an I mean, artist. I, you're not. You're not necessarily. Yeah. You're trying to make a good painting. That's right. And that's why I had to figure out the design here and not be just a slave to, you know, but I have to put that other little thing there or, you know, cause nobody's going to know, nobody is going to know if they look at this unless they were standing there going, that's impossible. You can't even see that part of that building. You know, they're not going to know. Everybody knows this scene and it's, I've made some changes, but that is reflected here in this design, you know, to begin with. So what I did then is I took um, a photograph of this and just for your benefit, uh, printed it out in black and white. And so you can really see how all of this holds together so well here when you squint down. And yeah, this does look darker. But these values within this shape, there, there's three whole steps that I can work with, according to my notes. And this shape, there's only one step. And so by keeping this, the part where I have added, you know, some interest in terms of uh, little subtle shifts of value, but I've got three steps to do that. And back here, keep everything much closer. I mean, if you could see this top of this and the sky, I'm sure you can appreciate that, but they're, they're really about the same value. So I've only got two steps back here. So I hope that makes some sense, but I plan Perfect all of that ahead of time to be able to do this painting. So now the difference this is going to be the fun part. The difference in this painting, I'm just going to scoot that over. And this painting, very little, but they're clearly two different types of day, right? You can tell that, you know, this first one was, you know, later in the day, the sun's going to be setting soon. And this looks more like, you know, bright, sunshiny day, right? But if you look at the values, and I've done my, I've done my sketch here, again, my thumbnail sketch, the values in these lights, I got very specific when I sampled this. The values in these lights are, go all the way up from 8% to 38%. So a much bigger range there than up here. The shadows are 38 to 85. And the majority of this painting is 30% or lighter. So what I'm telling you is that the lights go to 38% and the shadows go to 38%. And it is that meeting of those together that make this a totally different feel than this first painting where there was a whole step between the light and the shadow. You've completely confused me. Um, <laughs> I, I, so 38% in light and 38% in dark, is, is yes, that what you're yes. saying? So, so this value right here is, is 38%. So it's almost a four if, you had, if one was white. Okay. If you're doing Munsell, it would be a six, right? but we're not yeah. going to do that. Okay, okay. So this is almost 40, just under 40. And so is this. These are these, if you put them right next to one another without this little bit of dark in here, they Maybe would be the same. same value. Really? Okay. So now, but your light is also so at 38. Or all the way down to an eight. It goes way on down. This is the lightest light. Yeah next to the darkest dark. Yeah, but what's confusing me, I think I'm, I'm, I must be doing something wrong in my head because 38% uh, light, which you said is about a four, mm -hmm. right? And 38% yes. 
dark, which is about what? A four. A four. But how can those be the same value because one's light and one's dark? Well, because they're so far apart and there's this dark piece right here. Oh, uh, I guess believe. I was thinking, I, I thought you were referring to that bright yellow spot in the corner of that building. This is, this light is, is lighter, but okay. this light back All right. here. So the distance, and the this. distance light is the same light, but it's just reading lighter because it's against the darks. Yes. Okay. And so I know it's crazy. It's crazy that we have to actually think. People think that we don't even have to think. But what happens now is the same way in the first painting, you know, two thirds of this thing, more than that, were in shadow. They were 50% or more. But up here, because we can include this in our, not in our thumbnail sketch, but in our decision-making process about where the majority of the values fall. Are you with me? Yeah. The, the majority of the values, even though some of them are in shadow, are, are just a little bit lighter than a four. Okay. And so it gives the appearance of all of this seeming very light, even though in the, the no tan, the two value, it is a part of the shadow shape. Well, I'll tell you, that helps so much. It really does, because I, I, I always struggle with things like distant trees, and I know they're a darker value, but I want to make them feel more distant. And so I, I think that helps a lot, because now I can, I just, it's about more about placing darks in front of them. Yeah, well, and there are a lot of, there. that's one of the many ways to do it. And I think the more we experiment, you know, the more we find other ways to do it. And that's what's fun for me is saying, you know, how can I, how, you know, how can I be an illusionist? How can I give this feeling of whatever so that the, the, the message I want to say is evident without necessarily always jumping to the same little trick, you know, yeah. but learning right. other ways. And like a lot of times, of course, imagine uh, you, you know, sometimes you've been in a situation where, you know, the sky is fairly dark and there's a dark row of trees and, but there's a beautifully uh, illuminated front of a barn in shadow and it's, you know, the background is lighter. I mean, is dark, excuse me, background is darker. And so, you know, how can I, how can I make that illusion work by playing with these values and edges, what sits next to what and what is separated from something else? And so the, the thing to do, of course, is to make a whole lot of, a whole lot of different thumbnail sketches and then make some notes and then try try them in little small pieces before you know you get out the real canvas and start you, working on you've it. You've actually illuminated something that I've never really understood about the value of no tans, and it really is making sense now. So thank you for that. I yeah. I kind of derailed your conversation, so you got about no, no, five no. minutes left That's now. Fine. So That's I'm, fine. That's fine. I'm going to let you do what you want to do, and I'll I'll That's drop fine. drop out. Okay. Um, I want to show just real quickly, I did not do a thumbnail sketch of this one, but uh, as people watch this, or maybe if they re-watch it, I would like for them to just take a look at this and try to figure out on your own, it's your little lesson, to try to figure out on your own what I have done here. I want you to make a, a thumbnail sketch and I want you to come up with, you know, what you think are my little percentages here. And let me just set that aside. We got to see that. Now, the thing I did not talk about that I want to talk about for just a minute, and that is I get asked all the time from people, well, what do you do with flat light? So far, you've talked about light and shadow. And we mentioned earlier that sometimes a no tan is not exactly what you need. And so I'm just going to bring this down a little bit. My husband did build my easel. He gets credit for that. 
Um, and I have this little thumbnail sketch here. And you can see, hopefully you can see, that I've got three values. Can you bring it real um, close to the camera? Mm -hmm. Sure, 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 sure. See, there's okay, three. three values, right. Three values. And you can already tell that that's cows against the background, can you? It's just three little values. I couldn't and, tell until you told me. Yeah, right. Um, and I do have, uh, this will be a little more difficult for you to see probably, but let me show you. Um, the image that that came from is just on my, my iPad here, but you can see that it's cows against the background. Okay. And so I need three values to tell that story. It is not about light and shadow because there's no real shadow except underneath these cows. And it's so subtle that it's not about harsh light and shadow like all of these other paintings were, right? So in this case, I need three values to tell this story. I still don't need any uh, details. I just need to know, you know, the pattern of the little white heads and that the background back here where the trees are in the photo, the trees and the cow bodies really are the same value. And that this grass sits somewhere darker than their faces and lighter than the background. And cool. so I've, ri I've written myself a note that this is not light and shadow. It's three values and that the ground plane is about 50%. This whole big dark shape without the faces, this whole big dark shape is about 70%. And their little faces are about 20%. And so that's how you would design that. Now, just to let you know that that I am, I, I'm trying not to have an ego here. I'm going to show you what that looks like if you blocked it in even with people looking, okay? So I've got that done ahead because I knew we didn't have a lot of time. And so that's what that looks like when you block that in. And I have my little palette that I have mixed, pre-mixed pre just for you. Let's see if you can see that without too much glare. Yep, thank you. Do you see that the reddish orange and the green that are in the dark are the exact same value they are yes and then this grass is this lighter value i would and have so not about, thought it was that light but now you know seeing it on the palette i wouldn't have thought that but seeing seeing it on the painting yes it does that and so by knowing that what values my palette is my palette is about a six and I needed this piece to be a seven. So I just mixed pile that's one step darker. I got one pile of green that's got some red in it just for color harmony and one pile of reddish that's got a little green in it for color harmony. And then I knew that this pile, I already decided what you know value that pile had to be so I can compare it to my palette. And I had decided it needed to be like a 50. So it's one step lighter than my palette. And I just filled that in. And all I have left to do is, you know, cut some oh, that, shapes to make legs and paint a face. Well, that it really simplifies things, doesn't it? It makes a lot of sense. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure, sure. So, you know, just I can't say enough what it what it could mean to you if you just take some time to plan a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's been very helpful. I, I want to uh, thank you for doing this, Lori, and people can find all about you at your website, which is lauriputnam.com. Yep, that's and, my and then your, your other website is lauriputnam.online, which is where your online teaching is. Uh, also, you. Lori has a video with us and you can find it at lilypubs.com or lilyartvideo.com. And, and I'll just show that video, which was, uh, I don't know, we did this about five or six years ago, I, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's bold brush strokes and competent color. And this is the, the image from that painting. So Lori, thank you so much for being here thank today. Um, it's been a pleasure to reconnect and, and uh, we need to do this more often.
Yeah, that would be fun. Thank you so much. It's been good to see your little face. <laughs> okay, you guys, applause and thumbs up for Lori Putnam. And make sure you visit her website, lauriputnam.com or lauriputnam.online. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Eric.